Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Perry Halkidis. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs here at the College of Global Public Health. Thank you for joining us this evening for what is uh, sure to be an exciting discussion with author David France and documentarian David France about uh, the ACT UP days and his film, How to Survive the Plague, in his new book. Um, to begin our evening, we're going to start by showing a small clip from the film. If you haven't seen the film, I recommend that you, you do. It's a very powerful, moving um, documentary that captures that period of history quite beautifully. Several years ago, my friend and colleague, David Franz, contacted me. He was working on a new project and wondered if I could help him with access to the NYU library for this project, a film, and eventually this book about ACT UP. Without any hesitation, we set to work to provide David this access through CHIPS, our Center for Health Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies, not only because he was a friend, not only because he is a journalist whom I had respected for years, but also because he was setting out to tell an important story, one that had personal meaning to me and one that the world needed to know. Those of us who lived through those very challenging times of AIDS, of the AIDS epidemic, prior to the implementation of effective treatments, remember those days all too well. Collectively, my generation, that I have come to know as the AIDS generation, fought a brave battle against this insidious disease. All of us who came of age at that time, gay and straight, of all genders, races, and cultures from all parts of the country, were affected by this disease and the stigma associated with it, a stigma we fight to this day. While David was working on the film, I was working on my own book, The AIDS Generation, telling the life stories of 15 incredible men who, despite the odds, have managed to survive and thrive into middle age. When I was done, David graciously offered to write the prologue to my book, a powerful piece of writing that honors one of the great heroes of the early days of ACT UP, of the ACT UP movement, Spencer Cox, who sadly, and at a very young age, passed away a few years ago. Eventually, the film, How to Survive a Plague, was released to critical acclaim. This film is a masterful work of art that feels like a beautiful poem crafted from spliced raw VHS footage. I sat shaking at reliving all of the trauma when David previewed a small part of the film at Chips as he was working on it and felt the incredible honor, incredible honor yet the loss accompanied by, the, by great pride of my, of my peers when I watched the entire film at a screening in fall of 2012. For the film, David received the John Schlesinger Award from the Provincetown International Film Festival, the Jacqueline Donay Emerging Documentary Filmmaker Award from the International Documentary Association, and the New York Film Critics Award for Best First Film. The film was nominated for a 2013 Academy Award for Best Documentary, a Director's Guild Award, an Independent Spirit Award, and two Emmys, and won a Peabody Award, a Gotham Award, and a GLAAD Award. And now, we are fortunate to take another journey with David as he builds on the work of How to Survive a Plague, the film, with his new book, his fourth, How to Survive a Plague, the inside story of how citizens and science tamed AIDS. The book has been named in many top 10 lists of 2016 and is, was named on the top 100 notable books of 2016 by the New York Times. Of the book, Andrew Sullivan wrote in the New York Times Book Review the following, and I quote, a question has always hung over the reaction, the reaction of gay men to the plague that terrorized and decimated them in the 1980s and 1990s. Why did they not surrender? They came of age in an era of intense stigma and AIDS, as many Christian fundamentalists gleefully noted, appeared almost as confirmation that their wages of sin are death. They were surrounded by a culture that emph emphatically believed that they had asked for this. That mass death was, as the National Board of Review put it, retribution for a repulsive vice. How did they not entirely internalize this? Why, after a brief moment of liberation in the 1970s, did they not crawl back into the closet and die? David France's remarkable book tries to answer that question. It's the prose version of France's Oscar-nominated documentary of the same name, and somehow manages to pack all the emotional power of that film with far more granular detail and narrative, narrative force. I doubt any book on this subject will be able to match its access to the men and women who lived and died through that trauma and the personal testimony that at times feels so real to someone who witnessed it that I had to put the volume down and catch my breath." And then quote. And soon, this transformative work will become a limited series on the National Geographic Channel. In addition to all of this, David has worked at Newsweek, The New York Times, and New York Magazine, where he's a contributing editor. His other books include Our Fathers, an acclaimed investigation of the Catholic Church's sexual abuse crisis, and The Confession, a New York Times bestseller with James McGreevy. 
Several dramatic films have been inspired by his work, beginning with Thanks of, Thanks of a Grateful Nation, a controversial Showtime miniseries about the 1990 Gulf War, and the Peabody Award winner Soldier's Girl about a private's murder. Our Father is a Showtime adaptation of his book starring Christopher Plummer, Ted Danson, and Ellen Burstyn. Um, where am I here? Won nominations for Emmys and Writers, and Writers Guild of America Award. David is a graduate of Kalamazoo College. He lives in New York City in New Kingston, New York, and he is married to the producer, Jonathan Starch. Let me conclude by saying that I am so grateful to David for his work and thrilled that a new generation is learning the story of our generation. Perhaps for them, for you, our struggles and our resilience can provide the hope and inspiration in trying times that lie ahead. It is my great honor to introduce my colleague and friend, David France. Uh, 1984. The summer of 1984 saw a fulcrum of disease in the gay ghetto. At St. Vincent's, the emergency room was visible behind enormous windows on the corner of West 11th Street and 7th Avenue. Before the crisis exploded, how many hundreds of times had I walked past the window oblivious to the small kabuki th dramas enacted there? Now I found myself choked with panic every time I came near. One sticky afternoon, I slowed to measure the epidemic through the plate glass, praying to see only strangers. Three quarters of the seats were filled. Scanning the rows, I could see that every third or fourth man had the look, as we called it, sunken cheeks, spark hair, sparse hair, eyes that showed fear, shoulders that bent in pain. One, all spots and bones, balanced painfully on a pillow that he'd brought along from home. Another seemed to be dozing. His head was cocked backwards onto a companion's arm, and his mouth and his eyes were both wide open. The blind, like horses and snakes, don't need to close their eyes to sleep. A cab pulled up beside me. A healthy man, first out the door, bent to carefully extract his frail companion from the back seat, an operation as ordered and precise as origami. I held open the hospital door and, Blinkered by their mission, they picked past me without a nod. They were no older than I was. I remained on the sidewalk for a long time, watching them navigate the admissions process and settle into bucket seats to await their turn, the healthy partner whispering nonstop into his lover's nodding and sweaty head. That was my experience in the early days of AIDS. I stood on the sidewalks of the plague, grateful to not enter its tower. For me, that changed when Tom Ho took ill. Tom was tall and thin and always wore white denim jeans. He was the assistant art director at the New York Native, the gay newspaper, and my closest friend there. We were the youngest on the editorial staff, both 25. I found his room at the elbow of a long hallway inside Lenox Hill Hospital on the Upper East Side. He was propped up in his bed and staring sluggishly out the window his face still a topography of youthful acne. He was somewhat embarrassed to see me in the box of chocolates I held up in my defense, but nonetheless he welcomed me into his room and into his medical journey. His voice expressed amazement as though he were recounting the events in a film, how he was, had drenched his bed with sweat, how he drenched his bed with his own feces which emptied from him violently how the pneumonia burned his lungs and robbed his mind of oxygen, how he hadn't told his parents, would never tell his parents. He was born to immigrants and all that that entailed. I was the kid who grew up on the back of the Chinese restaurant at the strip mall, doing my homework, folding napkins. They never let me out of their sight. They never let me go to another kid's house. I celebrated my birthdays there all alone with a cake. He straddled three worlds with no overlap, China, America, and gay and now a fourth, the world of the plague. They have no idea that I'm gay. That alone would kill them, he said. At the native, I had edited, and he had pasted up endless horror stories about patients dying in isolation. It was heartbreaking to watch him adjust to the stoicism that such loneliness required. <clears throat> he stared through the window for a long time, ruminating. The only option I have, he said finally, shaking his head, is to beat this thing. He didn't lack an ability to situate his plight in the epidemic's un unforgiving timeline. Who do you think will be next, he asked. He speculated about Gary and, adver and advertising and Bruce in the art department. Bruce is getting skinny, did you notice? He's got the look. 
but that was Bruce's usual appearance. He never did contract AIDS. How about Peter, I asked. He's been out sick a lot. Tom smiled. If Peter escapes this thing, it, it can't be contagious. I would never see Tom Ho again. Later, I heard that he had left the hospital and returned to his family in the suburbs, having finally told them the truth. I learned that he slid into dementia, and it took him more than two years to die. But I mourned his passing that day. I left the hospital as if he were already gone, as the old hands in Auschwitz did for those they, that they distastefully called Muselmanner, the dead who hadn't died yet, a mere technicality. The look in his eyes seared in me, yes, but I was not yet numb from death, just terrified of it to the point of hypochondria and shameful behavior. I lifted my hand out of his with the same cold finality and let my friend die the death that he feared, isolated, alone, pulled back from his gay world through his American world and right back to the China of his parents' home, gone before he was gone. I went from his bedside and immediately made an appointment to see Dr. Joan Wakevitz a lesbian physician in her 40s, for a complete physical and release, hopefully, from fear. She understood my panic and offered comforting words, but there was nothing concrete for me. The antibody tests, far from reliable as they were, were not yet approved for regular use. Instead, she poked my arm with a four-pronged purified protein derivative test, originally developed as a screen for tuberculosis, but being used by doctors as an imperfect AIDS test. If patients with no immunity whatsoever, in patients with no immunity whatsoever, the four pricks would leave no marks at all. She sent me home to study my arm, and to my relief, marvelous plump boils appeared. This gave me no insights into my future, but at least it told me I would not drop dead anytime soon. I was a reporter during these years, and when AIDS struck um, the community, um, most of us felt a, a, a call to do something, uh, and we all found what it was we thought we could do and contribute in the crisis. Um, I knew I couldn't do the kind of patient care that so many people were doing. Um, gay men's health crisis, even at this point, had something like 1,500 volunteers taking care of something like 5,000 sick New Yorkers at the time, um, visiting them in hospitals and at homes, uh, doing their shopping for them, uh, taking care of their animals when they were sick and in the hospital. Um, I, I was nosy. I was naturally nosy, and I thought, well, I, I could teach myself something about reporting and put that skill to use, and it also allowed me a kind of an arm's length excuse, as it were. I, I knew nothing about science, but decided I would be a science journalist um, with some hubris, but also some sense of need and urgency. Uh, so that's what I set about to do. Um, and this book is, a, is my witness account of those years and the science and the scientific community as they were developing or not a, uh, uh, a real campaign to try to figure out what to do with HIV. And, uh, and it wasn't until the advent of activism and, and kind of the citizen science movement in activism that, that forced their way into the kind of the chambers of scientific research to... Uh, rectify the, the silence that was going on there, but also to become ultimately partners with the researchers, Nobel Prize winners even, in the research that ultimately brought about the, uh, the end of the plague years in 1996, which was 21 years ago. Um, I'll read a little more. <clears throat> Warfare, 1986. In the aftermath of the promising phase one trial showing AZT's r relative safety, Doctors Broder and Yarquin felt that they had ample evidence to suggest that the pills were not just tolerable, but dramatically effective. One patient in particular was their pole star, a New York City nurse who contracted AIDS through a transfusion. Her symptoms included a nasty fungal infection under her fingernails and severe oral canker sores. With AZT, both cleared up completely and the, uh, and the nucleus of a normal nail began to take shape. Dr. Yorkin, to Dr. Yorkin, this seemed near miraculous, but after the trial ended and the AZT was withdrawn, the clinical progress reversed. Monitoring the patient's blood, he saw new CD4 cells collapsing, ratios reinver reinverting, and opportunistic infections multiplying once again. It was something like flowers for Algernon, he told me. 
To see if the health gains could be maintained, they wanted to put the phase one patient back on AZT and follow all of their progresses for a long time. But they, to do so, they needed special permission from the FDA, which was not easily won. The regulatory agency didn't have a simple procedure for allowing experimental medications to be used therapeutically. But after initial intransigence, regulators ultimately agreed that it would be inhumane to refuse AZT to those 19 patients. Even while answering to significant questions, even while answers to significant questions about the compound's efficacy were still unknown, the FDA instituted an informal agreement allowing a very limited, compassionate use of the unapproved drug. By January of, of 86, Yarquin had was ready for the phase two trial, the true test of a new drug's efficacy. The design of the clinical trial called for a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled tri trial uh, protocol, long considered the gold standard. It meant that neither the researchers nor the patients would know who was on the placebo and who was not, both blind in other words, and only half of those patients enrolled around the country would receive AZT while the rest would take instead uh, a useless substitute made from cornstarch or salt water. The significant endpoint of this trial, the key variable in outcomes, would be death. If more people died on the placebo than on AZT, the drug would be considered beneficial. A phase three study would then go on to determine exactly how efficacious the drug was by measuring, measuring how much it extended life. Throughout January and February, the, trial details, the final details of the trial were worked out. 250 patients would be recruited through a dozen medical centers in San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago, New York City, and elsewhere. A center connected to the University of Miami, the Jackson Memorial Hospital, would take the lead. The point person there was Dr. Margaret Fischel, a timid general practitioner with a fierce intelligence and towering ambition, though she was just 36. What brought her to the attention of Burroughs' welcome, the drug manufacturer, was not immediately clear. She had authored three AIDS papers to date, won a case report on brain lesions, but had never taken on such a daunting responsibility. Her training was an, as an internist, not as a research scientist. The timetable for the study was ambitious. Enrollment would begin immediately, and the study would be completed by Christmas of, 90, of 1986. In order for patients to be eligible, they were required to discontinue any other medication during the course of the 24-week trial, including life-saving prophylaxis for PCP, the deadly AIDS pneumonia. For the trial to produce unambiguous answers, Burroughs Welcome deemed it essential to test AZT without the interference of those other pharmaceuticals. Dr. Samuel Broder at the National Cancer Institute concurred, knowing it condemned people to pre preventable deaths. God have mercy, you don't want to do this more than once, he told me. To Dr. Joseph Sonnebend, a clinician in New York, who had been following the trial's developments closely, this was tantamount to premeditated murder, no more ethical than denying patients food. His arguments were amplified by Dr. Mathilde Krim and others who testified that summer before congressional hearings about the immorality of these so-called death trials. Many argued for a more humane study allowing everyone participating to take the prophylaxis in addition to AZT, and most thoroughly rejected the use of placebos. Instead, they advocated for making the drug available to everyone in the study, no matter what else that they were taking, then comparing their health to what was already known about the natural course of an AIDS diagnosis. Dr. Krim went even further, adv advocating for making AZT broadly available to anyone who wanted it, even without solid data showing that it worked. Do we have the right to refuse a dying person a small gesture of hope, she asked? Or the dignity to fight to the end? But neither Burroughs' welcome nor the government was at all receptive. The last variable for the trial was dosing. This was the trial and error area of drug testing. The Burroughs' welcome team pushed for a very high dose, arguing that bombarding the patient would make it easier to read whether the drug worked or not. Damage to bone marrow, it was agreed, was an unfortunate but acceptable price to pay for, for certainty. The FDA finally agreed, approving a dose of 
1,500 milligrams per day administered every four hours, even through the night. This was the high end of the dose given in the safety trial. As an additional precaution, throughout the trial, the patients would be monitored by a data and safety monitoring board whose independent members had access to all the test results for each patient, secretly examining them weekly, ready to interfere if circumstances required. Early research was also underway on a host of other drugs. Ribavarin was being evaluated in a study group of about 50 patients. According to the rumor mill, its powers against the virus was not very promising. It had many fans on the underground nonetheless. The same was true for HPA-23, a, a drug that had drawn Rock Hudson to Paris and for which patients were still clamoring. The belated US trials for that drug involving just 42 patients found that HPA-23 gave patients a vague and fleeting sense of improvement with no clinical benefits. Early studies were in preparation or underway on uh, naltrexone, soprinosine, and cyclospirin A, whose manufacturers seemed to announce price hikes every time the gay papers published upbeat stories. In fact, the drugs seemed to be mostly inert against the virus. It was AZT that gave hope to the community for the first time. The New York native, keeping track of the original 19 patients, reported that almost all of the phase one trial subjects were still alive and stable four to eight months after entry into the study. This struck a chord with a dying population where people would give anything for an extra four to eight months. Five years into the plague, a, former, a formal nomenclature committee of eminent scientists from around the world took up the task of settling the dispute over the virus's name if not its paternity, which pit US and French scientists against one another. It was an American representative from the University of California, San Francisco, who proposed the inelegant descriptor human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, and the people in charge of such things at the Human Retrovirus Subcommittee of the International Committee on Taxonomy and Viruses found that that was quite acceptable. Dr. Luc Montagnier of the Institut Pasteur and his, and his and the French and the other French re researchers supported the change and quickly sought acceptance from the World Health Organization of the French translation VIH. Though he had no vote in the matter, Dr. Robert Gallo rejected the proposal outright, still fighting for the name that he and his NIH colleagues had registered with the US Patent Office, HTLV3. He argued his case obsessively. As the body count surpassed 16,000, his noxious squabble showed no signs of abating. In his own defense, Gallo made a point of asserting that none of the bi binational maneuvering had any negative effect on patient care, prevention, or ongoing scientific discovery. This claim was hard to defend. Under constant pressure, whether from him, which he denies, or his supporters, the FDA stymied the HIV antibody test developed by the French despite its superiority to the version registered by Gallo and the NIH. Finally, in February 1986, a year after the French submitted an application, the FDA did give its limited approval, but the distributors were specifically prohibited from mentioning studies that showed the sup superior accuracy of their product on the apparent grounds of national pride. This was, there was no way to know how many units of tainted blood slipped past the faulty screening test or how many people got sick as a result. The CDC would soon report one confirmed case of HIV transmission through blood that had already been screened with Gallo's test and shortly announced transmission to seven patients who received vital organs from a donor who had been screened twice, producing two false negatives. These transmissions could be blamed squarely on monopolistic intransigence. For their part, the French refused to adopt Gallo's uh, screen even when theirs lagged in production. Arrogance was a deadly vice. The matter of false positives was equally devastating, though harder to quantify in terms of lost lives. Whether a positive test result was true or false, the stigma was crushing just the same. Kids were removed from school that year based on rumors alone. In August, an hour after Manhattan man named Terry D'Angelo was told that he was positive. He leaped seven floors to his death. 
if even one of these cases stemmed from the unreliable test, while a better one was kept off the American market, the leaders of the American Public Health Service had to carry a heavy burden for those lives as well. His other assertion that in intensive scientific work had continued meantime did seem true in important regards. Between 1984 and 1986, the so-called period of discovery, as it would be called in, the re in retrospect, huge strides were made in the understanding of retroviruses and the immune system generally, and in the Solomonically disputed retrovirus in particular. Its peculiar physical structure was now established, as was its mechanism for infection and reproduction, and its life cycle. It was a typical retrovirus with a fairly high molecular weight. But genetically, it was way more complex than any other known retrovirus, unable to use a sequence of genes, able to use a sequence of genes for a wide range of adaptation. In essence, it could modify itself to accommodate each cell it infected. Remarkably, it managed these changes a million fold faster than most other organisms, as Gallo reported. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. As this exploratory work progressed, it became apparent that Dr. Gallo, not Dr. Montagnier, was the field's driving scientific mind. He had the idea to test for a retrovirus. He created the first continuous culture in which it would grow, and he showed its relationship to causing AIDS. In his memoir years later, Gallo said that debating whether or not he was the first person to physically lay eyes on the virus missed the point. Quotes, the argument stale and of little relevance to the scientists on either side, end quotes. The discovery was hypothesized by him, made possible by him, and spearheaded by him. After all that groundbreaking work was laid out, Montagnier's group of so-called crappy scientists, as Gallo told a colleague, simply lucked in upon the thing, like a bum tripping over a dropped wallet. This point of view had many adherents, even among some of Montagnier's universe. Around here, we say, he stumbled onto the virus and he's stumbling still, one of his colleagues admitted. Gallo, despite his obsessions and unseemly competitiveness, was the acknowledged genius in AIDS research. His annual lab meetings, attended by the world's top virologists and AIDS investigators, proved that he was one of the world's most formidable scientists, a researcher with the star power of Einstein, Einstein or Freud. Dr. Broder, who openly compared Gallo to both titans, considered him, quote, one of the paradigmatic figures of the 20th century. By contrast, Montagnier's lab was stymied, whether this was caused by the challenging science or because resources were depleted by the battle for credit, as he contended. He and the Pasteur team encountered roadblock after roadblock, with one standout exception. They identified a second strain of HIV in blood from West Africa, where HIV-2 was creating a heterosexual epidemic. Unlike HIV-1, as he called the Western virus, HIV-2 seemed, seemed as easily passed from woman to man as the other way around. Developing a clear picture of the catastrophe that this posed for the continent was hindered by Africa's weak health infrastructure and limited resources. Only time would tell. In the fifth year of the epidemic, the surge of media attention that followed Rock Hudson's death receded, and the Reagan administration called for a 22% reduction to the, physical years, to the fiscal year's AIDS budget, including $29 million cut in treatment and related spending. In case anybody contemplated targeting a prevention campaign to the gay community, which they didn't, Senator Jesse Helms, Republican in North Carolina, attached an amendment making it a federal crime to use any language or images that might be, quote, offensive to the majority of adults, end quote. His anti-gay Helms Amendment would proliferate in appropriations bills year after year. In the East Village, where I shared a rundown apartment on Avenue C, the scene was grim. Every building was a microcosm of the plague. Two floors above our apartment, a slender redhead from Georgia in his early 20s fell into a drunken tailspin following his diagnosis. For the several weeks before his family came to collect him, he lamented his faith, fate operatically in our living room, incapable of steeling himself for the coming battle. At a time when examples of sur surprising grace and fortitude dominated, his reaction, however under understandable, stood out. His sobbing was a tropical squall. 
We never heard from him again. Across the hall, Evelyn exiled her husband after a bout of pneumonia, won him a month in the hospital, and a discharge slip that said AIDS. When he returned, when he tried to return home, she met him in the hallway with a scorching rage over his admitted drug use. And as their two daughters, two young daughters, screamed in confusion, she issued final banishment orders. Day after day, he returned seeking forgiveness. She was too panicked about her own future to grant. One morning, I found that he had made a nest for himself in the hallway between our doors, heartbroken and des desiccated, as close to his girls as he would, would be allowed to get. Are you all right, Juan? I asked. Can I get you anything? I had to lean in close to hear his reply. My bones hurt, he whispered, shifting painfully from one emaciated hip to the other. He pinched at his yellow bedroll, unable to turn it into the cushion he longed for. His voice was hollow and raspy, the unmistakable sound of PCP. Do you have a doctor, anyone that I can call? He shook his head. At the VA, they told me to go home to Puerto Rico to die, but how? He stared at the door, keeping him from all of his resources. A sudden pain contorted his face. He gripped his abdomen and gave a, terrible, gave a, terrified, gave a look of terrified foreknowledge, but there was no time. His bowels emptied in a te terrific force, painting a mandala of excrement on the floor where he sat. Let me get you some help, I said, reaching around him. I pounded urgently on the door of his old apartment. No, 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 he cried. He whispered an incantation in Spanish meant to spare his daughters the sight of their befouled father. He managed to get to his feet, stroking the hallway clean with his bedding, and on fragile legs carried his shame down to the street. He need not to have fled. His wife never came to the door. That's all I'm going to read tonight. I, I know I read personal stories and some political stories. And in my uh, experience of those plague years, and I think it's true of anybody who lived through them and survived them, uh, the, the epidemic, the plague, was as personal as it was political and as economic and religious and spiteful as you could imagine. Um, but I'll leave the rest of the conversation for Perry. Thanks. What we thought we'd do now is, um, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to pose to David, and, and I'll, we'll open it up to the floor and just have a conversation. Um, so I want, I want to start with this question, David. On, um, on February 5th, the Boston Globe published a story that you were quoted in. Uh, by Renee Graham, in which you were interviewed, and that's this, the style of the story was, to counter Trump, act like, act up. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, yes, I can. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the timing of the telling of the story of, of uh, successful, kind of uh, triumphant AIDS activism um, was unexpected, to say the least, but um, it has become kind of the... Uh, the the, the go-to history for the activism that's that's taking foot now in anticipation of the battles and the many battlefronts that are going to be um, exposed in in the coming weeks and months, um, you know, ACT UP, um, and then after ACT UP, the Treatment Action Group um, kind of brought us to the end of uh, the plague years. They, as I said earlier, they were responsible for for helping to identify the medications. Uh, helping to design the drug trials that brought the medications into uh, test patients, helping to find um, the way through approval. And they, they, they did all of that, and we see it in the entire stretch of the 15 years of plague in AIDS activism by this kind of self-education, this kind of creation of this, this, uh, this knowledge base in science by non-scientists. Not one of the people who was working on this campaign uh, among the AIDS activists had any scientific training. Many have since gone on and have become research scientists or doctors, um, having begun life only as, uh, in some cases, uh, um, you know, drama school graduates, in one case, a high school dropout. Um, so it was really an unusual coalition of people who pulled together. Um, and they devised a kind of an activism, a new sort of strategy in activism, which they based on the experiences before them of the women's health movement and the feminist movement and before that the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and they, so they, they were really just taking everything from the past and advancing it to their current um, 
to their current uh, uh, crisis. And I think that's what we're seeing happen now in, in this new organi organ organizing that's going on. And, and they're not the first to look back at this period. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement very seriously has studied and, and replicated a lot of um, uh, ACT UP's strategy and organizational structure and the like. Um, and I know that uh, the pro-democracy movement in Russia and Moscow has, is using the, the uh, histories of, at, of ACT UP to, to find strength and courage but also ideas for how to proceed. And um, so that was the purpose of that article, I think, was to, to show that, that people are trying to find a way to take this one uh, uh, really positive, um, successful period of activism and uh, make it ready for the future. I mean, those were absolutely amazing times. And one, one of the questions I'm, I'm asked often by some of our students here is, you know, how do we get this movement started? You know, my response, my response is often you have to be consistent. You have to meet regularly. Sometimes there's going to be two people. Sometimes there's going to be 20 people. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's, I always tell people to get a room. You know, get a room. Um, the, there, there's a belief, I think, by people um, in, in today's culture that they're very well connected to one another through social media. And, and they are, um, but that it's, it doesn't replace what happens in the room. And, uh, and um, so I, um, I always counsel people to get together in person. And you and I watched that happen. We watched how poor ideas could enter a room and be batted around and wars and, and um, skirmishes could happen around those ideas. And, and ultimately, they create something useful and something powerful and positive that everybody can embrace. And you can't really have those arguments in the kind of flaming environment of social media, or at least we haven't seen it happen there in an effective way. And, um, and I will point out, and you probably know this, that, um, that at the Gay Community Center, which was the home base for ACT UP in New York, ACT UP went on to um, generate chapters, 147 chapters around the world, but the, the core nucleus for it was at the Gay Community Center on West 13th Street in New York. Every Tuesday now, the Rise and Resist movement is gathering the same kind of energy, um, meetings that go on for four hours, just as um, painful to sit through as ACT UP meetings were. Um, but they, uh, they're drawing 800 people every Tuesday now trying to figure out what to do. And many of those people are, are familiar faces. Um, I walked through the room last night. I, I did a reading at the center last night. And, um, and, and much of my audience was drawn down to the other meeting. Um, but I realized that you know, the... the uh, the index in my book named most of the people who were in that room who were just in, you know, sharing their knowledge and experience with a younger generation of activists. Um, you know, we've had some good news from the CDC recently, you know, a drop in, in, in new infections by about um, 18%, most between 2008 and 2014, mostly injection drug users and in, in heterosexual populations. But the truth is we have some 40,000 new infections a year. And many of those, if not most of those infections, are in gay men. So how do you respond about, to this idea that is often thrown around way too freely, I feel, that young gay men don't care about AIDS and they're not afraid of it? What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I, I guess I've been doing a lot of traveling in um, cities across the country, and I think they do care about it. Um, they, they don't have the fear that we had of it, and they don't need to have that fear. It's a different, different epidemic. We, we, we don't have to make them, you know, adopt the kind of uh, stance that we had. And, you know, I think those, that those data that you just mentioned are very powerful and important, but I don't think they've yet captured what the young gay uh, male population is doing. And, and there's been an adoption across the country um, in really powerful ways of, of, uh, of PrEP, which is the practice of taking uh, a pill when you're healthy um, to prevent H contracting HIV. And in fact, it's crazy effective. You know, it's, it may even be 100% effective. There, there are two or three infections that they've attributed to um, people who are on effective medication, but they're from a very, very rare form of the virus. So we, I think the data next year and the year after is gonna start to show us that young people, and, if, and here's, here's how I do my research about young people in the cities I've been speaking to. I go on Grindr. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the, you know, the, the, the hookup app. I don't have to explain it to some of you. Um, and they're advertising their, their use of yeah. PrEP 
Um, and, uh, and, and, and people are advertising their use of treatment as prevention. People who are HIV positive, we know this now, who take, effect, take HIV medication and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's effective for them, lower the, their viral load to the point where they're no longer infectious. I guess you guys already know this. But, so people are talking about it and people are doing it in the smallest cities in the country. And that I find really exciting. So I, I, I think maybe things are changing. Yeah. I think finally they have an answer in that population um, that they find acceptable, and condoms wasn't it. And you know whether or not it'll reach all the way down, you, you know the, the, the age group of the people who are ping-ponging HIV around is age 13 to 24, yeah, yeah so yeah. it's, um, you know, how do, how do we reach them, and how do we get them connected to medical care to the point where they can actually get these drugs, which are really expensive, right. to protect themselves. I mean, I agree with you. I think the tools are there. I think, you know, treatment as prevention, you know, this whole, this whole notion that undetectable is, equals untransmittable that Bruce Rickman and his group are putting together is, has a lot of power. I think there are structural, and we've talked about this here with some of the folks in the room, about these structural barriers, accessing health care, like, you know, con consistent interaction with medical providers. And that just makes, makes accessing something like PrEP let alone treatment, very complicated. And Absolutely, and it's affected by you know racism and everything right. else. I mean, the majority of the people who are, are catching, catching HIV every year are people of color, right. um, and they're poor, yeah. and um, and a lot of them, the big big subpopulation is transgender kids right. in their teens and early twenties, and and those are those are populations that ha just are not connected really to you know civic life in America, and and will um, have have even a harder path to follow in the coming administration. That leads, that leads to something I wanted to talk to you about also, which is this idea of, you know, I mean, we look at the rates of HIV, particularly in the South where they're growing, the, the rates are like through the roof and like young black gay men getting infected at, you know, rates comparable to the 1980s in the cities like Atlanta and, have, and what have you. But so what, how does the work, you know, that you've done with that, you know, the, your, your personal experience, your research, your research, your book, your documentary, the work of ACT UP speak to these issues of racism and discrimination and, you know, and social inequity and, you know, how do we, you know, take a, take that, that 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 power and bring it to to other pop other to segments of the population that may not be as connected as some of the people in the room were when we were there in the eighties. Right. Well, how do we even find them? Right. right. So where where are they? Because I mean, are they even attached to gay communities? Like, are they are they um, are they identifying as as gay the way we did? Right. You know. So what is what are those cultural norms? And I I don't know those things. Mm -hmm. You know. I know that that the documentary has been um, well embraced by young people. It's shown on college campuses all over the place. Um, and, um, and but that's still college campuses, right? So it's people who, who get that far. Um, and what they see in the film are young people, attractive young people, doing something and, uh, and accomplishing something. And when I first started traveling with the film, people would stand up in the Q&As afterwards and say, the most horrifying thing to me they would say, these are young people, I wish I were there. Mm. You know, they got such a sense of thrill out of watching, you know, the, this, this story of accomplishment, I guess. And, and all I could have, uh, draw from that is that they, they feel a, a remarkable lack of power. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, they, and they see how power could be exercised by even people who, who are as far from, you know, entrenched and, and as far from, you know, uh, civic life as, as the people were in our generation of gay people. And, and that thrills them. It really thrills them. And it took me a while to, to, you know, to be able to handle that kind of reaction because right. um, the, the one thing I wish is that I weren't there. Yeah. Um, uh, but and, and you can see that divide at about age 42, I think, or 43. <laughs> and then so anybody over that age can, you know, gets it, gets it the way I get it, and everybody under that age gets it the way the kids get it. So... Yeah. Empowerment, that's what it's about, it's empowerment. And that's what I think, that's what PrEP tells people, that you can love yourself, mm -hmm. and you can love your community, and you can love the people you're having sex with. Even, and one doctor in the book was quoted, in my book is quoted as saying, even if that relationship lasts only 15 minutes, yeah. and, and it can still be based on love, and, uh, um, but first you have to love yourself, you have to protect yourself in a way, and PrEP gives that power, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one more question, and I'm going to open it up to our audience. So I, I'll ask you by saying, how do you, how do you think our generation will be remembered? How do you hope it will be remembered? 
And God, I, mean, I haven't even thought about that, you know. But it's time. It's, I, I, guess, I guess it's time. That. Um, <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll answer it with a, a, an observation that's, that's kind of negative, which is that, you know, we, we still don't have, you know, nobody studies gay history, right? So I imagine you mean our generation of lesbians gay and gay men. Yeah, or, 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 you know, or any of us who came of age during that period of, you know, that, 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 that time that was so defined by AIDS. Mm. Will we be seen as brave? Will we be seen as Brazilian? Will we be, well, like, what, like, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, what will they say? Um, I, I wrote the book because um, I, I had written an article in New York Magazine about somebody that you and I both knew, Gabriel Torres. Yeah. Who was a doctor? Um, who was an amazing heroic figure in the in the plague years in New York? He ran, created, and ran um, the uh, AIDS ward at St. Vincent's, which was the the teeming epicenter of the epidemic, the global epidemic for many years. Um, he was also a researcher. He was also a, a beautiful and kind man, and I found him in 2008 um, at Rikers Island, where. He was not treating patients, but he was, uh, in fact, locked up, um, uh, facing multiple felony charges. He was drug addicted. He was um, homeless. He had seroconverted. He was HIV positive. Um, and uh, and he, he could not have been more destitute. You know, he could not have been, he could not have fallen further. And I, I, I wrote an article about, uh, asking the question, how could that have been? And I spent some time in the piece talking about his heroic past and what St. Vincent's was like and what it was like to live in a country where um, money was being taken away from research while an epidemic was growing from what was 41 cases in the first report to what became 80 million cases, you know, and what, what it was like to experience that. And the, the, the response to the article was all about that section of people who just didn't know. They just didn't know about that. And... Um, and that's why I started on this project, was because I, I felt like it, we had to tell people what happened then. And I've been a little frustrated that it's hard to, it's hard to teach gay history. You know, we've, we've, we've done a lot of, made a lot of progress in universities around the, the globe um, in, in queer studies. Um, a lot of it is theoretical, the queer theory, you know. Um, but, but where's the history? You know, where are our history books? And... And why aren't they, why isn't there a shelf for our history books? And why aren't there courses for our history? And so I, I don't know how they're going to remember us, but it's my campaign to make sure that they remember us for what we accomplished and the legacy that was, that was really left behind. You know, these drugs now keep almost 20 million people alive around the world. Um, still only half of the infected population, living population, but that's, that's 20 million people kept alive thanks to the work of a very small group of mostly infected men and women who took on the challenge of of breaking the back of HIV and they took it on very personally but they they left this in, incredible tool to humanity thank you for that i mean i, I think I think there is some hope. I mean, I actually was, uh, my husband is actually doing a master's here in social studies education, and I was just looking through a syllabus the other night, and I was thrilled to see that there was a whole section on LGBT history, and I'm oh, like, yeah. so at least we're training teachers at NYU, here's a plug for NYU, um, to, 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 talk, to talk about LGBT history to their students. Um, we're going to open it up to the floor for questions for David. So I stand corrected then, but, you know, they, I'm, oh, well, we have a long way to go. <laughs> so, but you know, I, I found out that people were in like public health um, master's programs were studying the epidemic by watching my documentary, which is hardly a you know a scholarly tool. <laughs> you know, it's it just a it needs like your book. It needs you know we we need these stories to be told and published and prompt you know you know made made available to everybody. Well, it needs to be made real, and I think several of our students here are masters of public health students now and are really really grateful for the work you've done to tell these stories. Excellent. Danny. So we're using your film in our class mm -hmm. on HIV. So thank you, because I think that for some of our students, they, don't, they didn't grow up watching this on TV. And so it's very um, visceral what we see. And I think it's an important story to tell. And those are the stories that actually inspired me to go into public health. So mm -hmm. thank you for telling those again. My question for you is, um, so we have this new administration who 
has alternative facts and doesn't really like science. Um, and there's, there's some scary things happening now. And my question for you uh, from your experience as a journalist and working in, in this space is what would, should we be worried about? What should be, we be worried about in changes in, related to HIV policies, to drug policies? And when we go protest on April 22nd in DC in, this, in the March for Science, what should, be, what should we be advocating for? Well, I think we should be scared of everything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a, a, a battle on all fronts, right? So here we have this vice president who, as governor of Indiana, oversaw and created the environment for a huge outbreak of HIV. Um, he did that by defunding you know, the public health campaigns there. Same happened in Florida, right? So um, we see what happens when you take money away from public health. Um, and it, I don't know if I know that, this, uh, that what I'm saying is gonna be correct. But in, in AIDS activism, the first many years of AIDS activism, there was a lot of, you know, kind of um, screaming. There was just a lot of, you know, people saying stop it or start it without, um, uh, without specific aims. And simultaneously, there was an attempt to recreate in a kind of an underground way the, this, this, the scientific endeavors, the, the, the drug pharmacopoeia, um, in the buyers clubs that were created all over the place. And come 1987, when ACT UP started, there was a change in which, in which they determined, and there was one woman who explained this to them. She said, you're not gonna save your lives by creating a parallel universe. You're gonna save your lives by making the real universe work for you. And um, so, so, you know, I don't think that we can go out and create, a, um, a, you know, some sort of a parallel campaign to the CDC, um, I think the, the battles have to be on directly toward, aimed toward those institutions to make them do that work. And, and I think we know that there are, well, we, of course we know that there are people inside there who want to do it. That's what all these leaks are about, that yeah. they can't get anybody above them to pay attention, so they're, they're sending out these little, floating these messages in, in bottles out to us. And I think we've got to find them, find those people, and build coalitions with those people and use them and let them use us to, you know, to keep the ship afloat. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what you bring to, to, uh, to Washington. The, the, the trick that ACT UP learned and the, the strategy that they um, identified uh, was something they call the inside-outside strategy. Armies of people on the street protesting, blocking traffic, in, invading buildings, um, um, and all of that was to force open the doors so that the inside group, the, the, the group that was the kind of think tank in ACT UP, could go inside and have conversations, forced and very tense conversations, but unavoidable, unavoidable converse, conversations because of those crowds. Um, and they worked really well together in that way, not only in the scientific work that ACT UP did, but they also accomplished tremendous things in the area of prevention in the area of, of housing um, and housing policy, insurance policy. They fought insurance companies and the way insurance uh, companies were regulated. Clean needle exchange was an invention of ACT UP activists and that sort of thing. So um, stay on the streets, but also prepare your people to go in through the doors when you finally get them cracked open. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you uh, for coming to speak. Your words were very moving. Um, kind of, I guess in a similar vein, um, one thing I was struck by you, uh, that was um, in the film and that you'd said is that ACT UP, it, it really seemed like it started as a, a local movement here in New York and then chapters opened up in other states. So there's been a lot of focus and a lot of attention on um, Washington and the new administration, but we know that a lot of uh, nefarious activities happen at the state level too that really affect a lot of people. Um, so um, what is your take on, uh, well, first of all, how, how did the, uh, the local chapters of ACT UP 
work and how effective were they and, and, and how can we replicate that? Because I, I'm originally from a conservative state, so it's easy to kind of see things happen here in New York, but I worry about my uh, LGBTQ friends back home and what can they do and how can maybe places like New York City be an example for them? How can we communicate what works for us here uh, to make it work for them there? Um, they didn't have social media back then. They didn't have the internet back then. They, um, they barely had access to facsimile machines. <laughs> and I find out that on college campuses, a lot of people don't know what a facsimile machine <laughs> was. Um, so they, they actually flew. You know, they, this is an all-volunteer organization. Nobody got paid. And for, for 15 years, most of the activism in, in, in AIDS was unpaid. Um, but they raised money to buy tickets to meet people in other cities. And they would have kind of regional meetings. I, you know, one meeting that I uh, talk about in the book was in a Dallas airport. So all the regional ch chapters all agreed to fly to Dallas. And they never left the airport. They had their meetings there and flew home. You know, so they, um, they made sure that, they, that everybody was working in concert and that everybody knew um, what, what the advancements were and, um, and, and, and could discuss these kind of new strategic changes. Um, but at the same time, they used the media. And you know, one of the things that, um, that today's activism is suspicious of is the media. Um, and the media did screw up uh, and, um, and, and has screwed up and, um, and may not be a great ally, but, um, but activism then learned to use the media to its own aims. You know, don't walk away from it. Don't create a parallel media. Don't just use the social media. Get the message out to people who are getting their media from other places, their news from other places. Um, but then again, so now you've got social media, and I do believe there's a tool for you know Twitter and Facebook and 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 others for sharing that news and for for allowing people from other cities to attend your meetings. You know in other ways and to feel what that's like. And the meeting last night was just really exciting and you get a sense of that excitement and you, and, and you have a sense of wanting to join it even if you don't know exactly what you want to do with it. Hi, I just uh, wanted to say thank you for coming and speaking to us. Um, my question revolves around uh, how we can confront uh, activism in a social media age, especially with uh, Gen X and millennials uh, receiving their information online, uh, where a scientific community, uh, where the, the science becomes diluted almost, and there are so many information sources from everywhere. Uh, how can we um, use ACT UP as a, as a platform for, uh, creating social change in this new uh, internet age? That's a, that's a really good question. And, and it reminded me um, that at every ACT UP meeting, there was a messaging segment where uh, somebody stood up, it was usually one person, Ann Northrup, stood in, in the New York chapter, stood up and said, okay, this is, these are what the issues are today. Um, how can we distill them into like a, a sound bite? And everybody was made uh, into a spokesperson for the organization, and they all rehearsed those sound bites, and those sound bites were, you know, gave the information that just the tip of that iceberg, so that people had a sense of what the truth was, or what the issue was, or what the uh, crisis was, um, and they could convey that. Um, and so there was a pre, kind of a pre-chewing of the information that took place at those meetings. You remember that how they would. Um, they, they would really rehearse them and they, people would throw up their suggestions and, and they would come up with, the, with a sentence. Yeah. You, know, we, you know, the elevator pitch, they call it in, in filmmaking, right? So the, the one little thing that if anybody asks you this week what the issue is, you know it. Um, and th that is, you know, you can do that in 140 characters and that can become the, the messaging point for the, for the week. And, um, and I, think, I think that's a, a real um, positive lesson that we can get from ACT UP about about keeping everybody on the same page. I think the same, I think the same, like I think the, the, the two most helpful, two amazing things that you've talked about here, and I, and I agree with you, is a space where you come together and interact with each other, and it could be a cyberspace, but a physical space does something different, and everybody on message, right? If everybody's saying the same consistent thing, eventually it grows. Right. Yeah, I thought that was one of the most brilliant things about that. It was, it was really cool, and then that was, she was always followed by, um, 
Ron Goldberg. Yeah. He was called the, the chant queen. And um, so if you were going to have a demonstration that week, he would help you with your chants. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was all, I mean, these meetings went on forever. They were really deadly. Um, <laughs> because all of this work was done. But, um, and it was done every week. Yeah. Right. Every, right. You just went, right? And sometimes at the beginning, the room wasn't so packed. And the room was completely packed, right? Yeah. And build it, and they will come, right? That's the message here. Other questions? Right up here. Hi, thanks for sharing. Um, my question is, what words or encouragement would you have for those who are looking to participate in whatever movement, so whether it be Black Lives Matter, whether it be something similar to ACT UP, um, when you have like your own internal kind of resilience, but it's conflicting with the external factors. So it's kind of like, for example, like we do all this fighting for like, you know, same-sex marriages and all of this stuff, but then we have these new people coming into office that are looking to kind of change things. So right. like what words of encouragement or what kind of advice would you give for those? That, that's a really interesting question, and thanks for it. The, um, the, the quote that you read from Andrew Sullivan yeah. um, asked that question, you know, why did some people not just go and die? Why did the community not just disappear? Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't everybody who had that kind of courage to do that. In fact, we talk a lot about ACT UP as being a kind of a mass social justice movement, but it never had globally more than 10,000 members. Um, so it was really pretty tiny. Um, and, and, and it scared a lot of people. A lot of people just didn't have the kind of wherewithal to go and fight those m fights every Monday night or to go and get arrested two and three times a week. Um, but what that example teaches us is that even that small number of people, if determined and clever enough, or um, uh, if they give themselves enough credit for being clever enough, they can, they can actually make a difference. Um, I, I don't know what we're fighting now. I just don't know. It's, I don't think any of us knows. I, I, at first, I thought it, it looked a lot like the Reagan years. And there, there's some language that I thought we would never hear again from the Reagan years that's coming back, especially the stuff on queer issues, um, um, on race issues. Is that a fire? <laughs> Is that the uh, KGB? Right, sure. <laughs> Putin just came. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's very top-down, this problem that we're having. And, um, and they're the problem. I mean, and, but uh, HIV was our problem, and they, and they were getting in the way of it. So all we did was you know, focus on HIV. They are the problem now, and I don't, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. We're certainly going to need allies in politics. And um, I was talking to a friend last night, and, and he decided that he's, he's a, he just had to convince himself that 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 goodness will prevail, and just the idea that that he that he had faith in humanity and faith in the American people uh, is what um, gave him strength. And but he's activated. You know, I think we all have to activate in some way. Like I was saying about the early epidemic, find what you can do, find where your skill set or your you know character traits will be useful and dedicate yourself to it. Thank you. Um, it's the most extraordinary chronicle. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Um, what I partly don't know at this point is um, what the parallel chronicle is on a global scale. I wonder if, if you, you know, in the course of writing it, researching it, if you began to have a sense of how that's being done or will be doing or, or peers are doing it. Um, and the other question I was really curious about in terms of the writing of it is that plague has such an extraordinary kind of prehistory in terms of writing, both fiction and nonfiction. And I think people both cooperate with that and resist it because it's, it's you know, myth and fact. But I wondered if at certain points you were impacted or inflected by 
Camus or Boccaccio, whatever it is, these kind of classic plague accounts. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that when we first um, opened our Twitter account, we started being followed by a lot of zombie apocalypse people. Um, like a lot of them who really were excited that there was an, like a new player in the game. Um, so yes, we studied the zombie world and um, you know, uh, uh, those texts, uh, Camus especially and, um, and others, were a, kind of the, the regular reading of those years. Mm. So um, you know, ACT UP read those texts and, and spoke about them. There, it was a very, um, you know, the, 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 while they were educating themselves on policy, they were also educating themselves on kind of they were, the, what this would look like historically and, and what it would look like kind of emotionally. And um, I, I went in my re research also to, to look at um, the psychological uh, um, research on, on other survivors of mass death episodes. I, I, you know, I read Primo Levi, I read, um, uh, I, I read the accounts of the, 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 the medical accounts and scientific accounts of, of, of the people who survived the Holocaust, the people who survived the nuclear bombing of Japan. The, um, there's, it's a very thin literature um, for the most part. Um, but so, so I was really interested in what the, what, what the condition of survival was. And, um, and I think I focused a lot on that in the, in the book also. Um, and uh, I don't remember exactly the first part of your question. Just obviously, this is oh, primarily a, a New York but story, an American story. The sequel to this book is about, uh, uh, about the rest of the world. Um, right. No, I'm, no, I'm not, um, or at least not that I know of. And um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> But it's really about access, right? So in fact, it involves many of the same people um, who are in this book. Once, once 1996 came and the plague years, the years where it was not possible to survive or virtually not possible to survive an HIV infection, once those were, came to a close, a lot of these same activists went, moved to Africa and began building the, the pathways to, to access to the medication there. And that was an incredible fight. And, you know, it's, it, it, the drama of that could narrate a, a, an enormous textbook as well. Um, uh, nobody wanted to do it. Nobody believed that it was doable. Nobody believed that um, people in remote villages w um, that were, um, you know, bombarded by AIDS death, that they would be w capable of taking AIDS meds on a regular basis, which is just racism and, and bigotry. And, um, and activists, both... Um, um, local activists in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and those who, who came to help them um, really fought hard to, to get that changed. And, and that's where the drugs are now. And that's, it's, it's really a, a, an incredible political story about how those drugs got there. And it involves this weird like second act twist where um, George W. Bush gave it power. Like George W. Bush who did only one good thing in eight years, started this you know, PEPFAR campaign to get drugs out to the developing world. You know, why he did it is going to take you know, uh, you know, somebody with a, a degree in psychiatry, I think, to try to figure that out. But, um, but I, I actually believe that it was, it was religion. I believe that he was called by God to do this and, um, and, and, and did it in part because you know, the African victims of AIDS were in his mind, innocent victims, you know, because they were heterosexual and not IV drug users. And, but he did it, he opened that thing up, and now it's, as I said, 20 million people. The very end of my film in 1992, I said, six million people are now alive on these drugs. And uh, that was, I'm sorry, that was 2012 when the film came out, six million people. And now, in those few years, it's, you know, it's, it's a, just a great expression of, of political will on the part of so many countries and the pharmaceutical industry, um, which was hammered by activists, um, agreeing to let the drugs go for, for very cheap, way under a dollar a day now in the developing world. We're not paying those prices here, but, but that's how they made them available. Um, I'd love to see that book. Um, I think it'd be a really exciting book to read too. So I'm gonna say thank you to David for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you everybody.